Okay, so here we are. Welcome back to chapter four. We're going to talk about managing expenses. So, what are the things that we're going to be dealing with today? Is going to be we're only going to cover the first, like, really small section、um, of chapter four, which is dealing with vendors itself. Okay. Vendors are going to be people that the company uses either as、um, a service provider or to purchase products from, in hopes to resell the products out. They also use、um, vendors as any like some form of ten ninety nine contractor, right? Anything that anybody that provides a service. So if they need to fix something in the In the company's office, that's going to be a service that's being provided to us as a company, right? And that's what a vendor does. They either provide services or they provide products for us. Okay. So that's what this whole purpose is. Is going to be that one hundred percent on most cases.、Um, that oftentimes vendors are going to all there are going to be mere expenses to the company. So, if they're going to be mere expenses to the company, therefore we need to understand how we can enter expenses into QuickBooks, and how do we do that? Well, that's what this whole entire chapter is about. So, when we look at the、um, managing expenses workflow, right? We're particularly looking at this section right here at the top of the、um, homepage, which is dealing with your vendors. Now, of course, we're not going to talk about、um, purchase orders. At, well, okay, well, we will talk about purchase orders, but in regards to inventory, this section right here is in chapter eight. So this is not something that we learn until、uh, two weeks from now. Okay. What we're primarily focusing is entering bills and paying them. Okay, now that's only if it's a credit vendor, right? We also have a cash vendor, right, where we pay the expenses as we go. We go to a store, we buy something, we pay them. Boom, done, right? So that is something that we can also do as well. Is that you have the ability to use, and we're going to check this out. We're going to be focusing on the banking section of the homepage, which is one using the check register and also writing an actual proper check. Okay. So that is going to be dealing on how we enter in expenses into QuickBooks. So. Like we've mentioned before, let's go ahead and introduce to you the vendor center. Okay, so if if this is the transaction here, all things that have to deal with a vendor in particular will could could be done actually in the vendor center itself. So here, I opened up the vendor center. There are three ways to get to the vendor center. Okay. If you look carefully on the homepage, it's an actual blue tab, right? If I click on that, it says right here. If I roll my mouse over, it says go to the vendor center, and then if I click on it, it will open up the vendor center. Okay, I can also access the vendor center by going up to the top of the menu bar, clicking vendors, and the first thing you see is vendor center. All right. And another one, because it's a default setting, is actually going to be on your icon bar. Okay, your icon bar. If I scroll down, you're going to have、um, a、uh, icon for your vendors, and that will take you directly to the vendor center. Okay, so those are three ways that we can enter、uh, or go to the vendor center. Homepage.、Okay. So you can go to the vendor box. You can go to the top menu bar, and you can go to the icon box to access it, right? Okay, so when we talk about the、uh, the box, that's considered the home page. So make sure because、okay. um the questions I ask you, it's it's very specific. So if I say how do I access the ve- the vendor center, you have to say on the、okay. home page. Yes. Okay. All right.、Thanks. Home page at the top of the vendors menu. Very first thing, and the vendors icon on the vendors on the icon bar. Okay, now let's take a look at this vendor center. So as we can see, it gives you a list of all the vendors that exist in the company that you 
have relations with or transactions with. It gives you the current balances. So in this case, I owe no, I owe no, I don't owe anybody anything except for the state, of course, because of sales tax. And I owe Wong and Son um, video production, okay? And I owe them that much. So it gives you a synopsis of pretty much everything that you need to know. It gives you all the vendor details um, in regards to when you click on each particular person. So for example, a supply, if I click on a supply, on the right side will give me my vendor contact information, okay? At the bottom will give me all the transactions that I have dealt with with this particular vendor, okay? And um, I can even look at the transaction list. If, I'm, if I don't want to go through the vendors itself, I can look at what bills I made, what bill payments I've made, and so on and so forth, okay? But in this case, I just want to focus on just my vendors. Okay. Um, again, each one that you select will obviously change everything that you have on the right side. Okay. And of course, with the vendor information, you can always edit the information at any given time. As you can see, the little pencil right here. You can pin them to make a note to them. Okay. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, okay. Now, of course, this is a way that you can be, are able to be able to do all the transactions necessary that deals with a vendor. So if I go up to the window, right, and I click new transactions drop down menu, it says that I can enter a bill, I can pay a bill, I can send a purchase order, I can receive items, I can also um, enter bill and receive items, okay? So there's these are the transactions you can do. But if I right click on any vendor, my list of transactions expand beyond those, those five um, transactions that you have. Here, you can edit a profile, you can create a profile, you can delete a profile, okay? You can go as far as um, even make this vendor inactive, right? You can create, you can create vendor statements, all right? Stuff like that. Okay. So the thing is, you could do a lot more if you just right click, All right? Um, and yep, and that's as far as we go for the vendor center. So that is the vendor center. Okay. Um, and let's see what the next section says here. So what we're gonna actually do here is right. We talked about what the difference between a cash vendor and a credit vendor is, right? We do have those opportunities where we just stop by a supply store and we pay them with cash. That's a cash vendor, right? Where these ones are typically when you have the opportunity to purchase or have a service provided by them and they bill you after either the, um, the job has been done or they bill you a quote or they bill you something, right? They make you pay after the job has been completed. That's going to be your credit vendors. And those are the reasons why you want to use the enter bills function. Okay. Now, again, the great thing about using QuickBooks to enter this in for you is that it helps you remind you for the people that you owe and give you kind of like a quick scenario and a synopsis of how much you owe them. Right. Without even actually looking into details of what you owe them for. Okay. So once again, the, the vendor center is a pretty useful um, place to be to get all the information you need for entering in an expense. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is here is we're going to set up a vendor. Okay, we're going to set up Mr. Boswell Consulting. Okay, now how do I do that? Well, let's take a look. All right. You have to be in the vendor center. There is no other way for you to enter in a new vendor except through the vendor center. So whether you go through the home page, the icon bar, or the menu bar, that's the only way you'd be able to be able to add a new vendor. Okay? You don't have that option on the vendor's menu list. Unfortunately, that's one of the things that you don't have. Okay? These are transactions that you deal with the vendor, not create the vendor. So in this case, any way that you get to the vendor center is going to be the way that you enter in a new uh, profile, okay? 
So again, at the very top of this um, window right here, if it's not there, uh, well, it should be there, okay? You're going to do the drop-down menu, and you're going to click on New Vendor, okay? You also have the option to enter in multiple vendors at one time, okay? And, of course, you can right-click anywhere on here, and you can create a new vendor, okay? New vendor. Now, what does it mean? What do you mean I can add multiple vendors at one time? So I'm going to show you this first, and then I'm going to go through whatever the book says. So exactly like how we can enter in a chart of accounts, you can enter in multiple vendors at one time. So in this case, right, you have um, the company name, the person's first name, the middle initial, the last name, et cetera, et cetera. And the list goes on and on, right? All the information that you need to have for that vendor. Yes, you can put it in here. Yes, you can export Excel and put it in here. You can copy and paste from Excel and put it in here as long as the columns match, okay? Now, again, that is more advanced level of QuickBooks, and that's not what the book wants to teach you. But I'm giving you this knowledge now that, yes, you can do it, all right? And this is for primarily companies who's been using QuickBooks a little longer, but also for companies that are already pre-existing, that have to enter all these people and all these customers and all this information, all the vendors and everything, it will save them that much time. Okay, so once again, that is something that's level advanced uh, for QuickBooks, so I will not show you how to do that, okay? Um, but it's straightforward. You can look on resources on how to do that. Pretty straightforward, okay? But I'm going to show you how the book shows you because it is the basic um, basic of how to enter in a uh, vendor itself. And it's pretty straightforward. So if I click on new vendor, right? A new vendor window pops up and guess what? It looks just like this and it makes it that much easier because guess what? It's a form. You just fill it just like you're at a doctor's office. What's your name? What's your address? What's your telephone? What's your email? That's the same exact thing here. It's all about filling in information. Now, in this case, right, we'll start with the top one, which is going to be the um, address information. Now, you have two options when it comes to doing this, right? If you choose to do this, right, this is what I mean. So as your list, so let's take a look at that list one more time. So let me shrink this up, okay? Let's take a look at your vendors list. Every single thing is based on whether it's the company name or whether, um, yes, it's based on the company name. So in this case, right, it is very important that you um, type in the company name as is. But when we talk about other lists, such as your customers and your employees, it's important that you know this, that whatever you put here is going to be different than what you put here. Okay, but let's say you don't fill this part out, right? Let's say I don't put Boswell Consulting in there and I decided to skip that part and I go straight into the company name, Boswell Consult, Consulting, I think, Consulting, Consultant, Consulting, right? If I skip this part right here and I go ahead and just go dive right in, it's going to automatically fill in the form. The information for you. However, if this is an independent contractor and you decide to go straight forward to here and put their company name or their first name and then last name, it's going to populate as first name and last name. Where in this case, right here, this window right here is what you want to display on the actual list itself. Okay, so note that's two different things, but if, you're, if you don't do it, that's okay. QuickBooks will fill it in for you automatically. Okay? Then you have an open balance. Now, in this case, recommendation is to leave this at zero at all times. Okay, Your best bet is to enter in all of those transactions after you've created this, port, this um, profile. Because in this case, if you add an opening balance, right? 
QuickBooks is not going to know what bill was came in, what you owe, how many bills that you owe, and how many payments you need to make. Okay, so that's why they recommend you to keep this at zero. And what you're going to do is you're going to retroactive and uh, and retroactively enter in all of the transactions that happened in the past. Yes, you can do that, right? You see this little calendar, little eye calendar icon. You can click that and go back as far as you like. And that's the great thing about QuickBooks is you can add transactions that happened 20 years ago. But then again, that doesn't make our information relevant, right? It makes it, it makes it wonky because we have transactions that happened 20 years ago and then present time, right? So suggested wise, um, if you haven't paid them off yet and you have the bill, just put in the actual original due date or the original date that you received it um, because then it will reflect what the true statement is, which is you owe them on this date, on this date at this time okay but yes you can retroactively actively enter in transactions that happened in the past okay so boswell consulting um let's go ahead and say what is this person's name this is going to be a mister okay first name is steven okay um steven boswell i believe i don't believe he has a middle name middle initial Stephen Boswell okay job title he is going to be the owner okay main phone number okay so I believe he is okay Oop. this is the wrong one this is chapter seven I need chapter four okay so in this case, chapter four, we got Stephen Boswell. All right, and his phone number is going to be Boswell Consulting. His phone number is 510-555-0305. Okay, that is his main phone number. Okay. Um and I believe he does have a work phone number, which is 510-555-5500, okay? He doesn't have a fax number or a website. Yes, he does. It is Boswell, Boswell right now, okay? Um, that's the website. So in this case, let's just fill in the address first, and then we'll come back up here. Okay, so the address, no, we got to do this first. So in this case, his main email is steve, okay, S-T-E-V-E, -E, at um, boswellrightnow dot, is it dot biz? Dot U-S. Okay. Again, website's going to be Boswell right now. www.boswellrightnow.us. Okay. And then now we're going to make it down to our address. Now in this case, right, this is going to be the billing address. Whether you want to use both his uh, company name and his first name is optional, right? In this case, I'm going to bill him to this because that's usually what happens is it's going to have both names. And he is actually giving us a postal office address. So P.O. Box 620, I believe. Okay, P.O. Box 620 from Oakland, California. Okay, Oakland, Calif... Yep, yep, Oakland, California. And the zip code here is going to be... 94510. Okay. 
Now, here's what's also cool about QuickBooks is that it allows you to save extra, extra time. So by taking a look at this, right, I can go ahead and copy that information into my shipping address. So I can go ahead and click copy because maybe his billing address is going to be the same place that I ship items to. But in this case, I don't have to include Stephen Boswell or Boswell Consulting. It could be either or. Now, in this case, if I'm shipping to their company, I rather have just the company's name versus just the um, uh, just the uh, you know having both names on there. Okay, so there you go. I can clean that up by doing that. So that means I'm going to be shipping these out to Boswell Consulting, which is the same exact address. So in this case, instead of having to copy and paste it myself, I can edit the information and it will appear just like that. Okay. Now, be careful. Don't click OK because we're not done with this profile yet. This was just the basic information that we can do for um, Boswell Consulting. I still need to go through all the other extra information because this is what's going to help me fill out the my uh, purchase orders, my billing information. It's going to help me fill it out a lot more quickly, right? So, for example, payment settings, okay? Payment settings is going to see. Now, this, because this is um, a vendor to us, right? This is going, this account number is going to be our account number that we have with Stephen Boswell, okay? Not the other way around. Not what Stephen has an account with us, no. Because they are the vendor, this is the, um, this is the account number that I have with them. So the account number is 666. Six, ooh, where is my cursor? 66-112, six, six one, one, okay? And then, of course, payment terms. Does um, Stephen give me some terms? And he does. He gives us 2% 10 net 30. So, again, I'm going to drop down my menu and go ahead and look at that. So, by us creating all of these items and all these lists, right, it makes it that much easier to fill out the information. And you know what's even better? I don't even need to do the drop down menu. I can just simply type it in and it would automatically populate just like how Excel does with the autofill tool. It will populate that and if I want that, your best friend is going to be the tab button, not enter. Enter is going to validate that the transaction has been completed. All right, so little fun fact here, tab is your best friend. And if that's the one you wanna select, you select tab and it will move it across to the next one. So once again, that's the whole thing about QuickBooks is, right? When I said, instead of memorizing the whole entire account, you don't need to. You just type in the first couple letters and search what you need because that's how QuickBooks makes it a lot easier for you. Instead of memorizing a million accounts that you have in a system, just if, if, if you know, just make sure that whatever account that you're gonna use Type in, the, type in the first two letters and it should populate automatically for you. But that's something that you have to create ahead of time, right? That's why last chapter we created those terms in our terms list. So then the next time we ever need to use it, we just populate it just like that, okay? Again, uh, let's see for credit limit. Um, this is the credit limit that, that Boswell puts on you. In this case, there's no credit limit and there is no um, billing rate level. Okay, so a billing rate level is what they charge you at. So whether you're a commercial or you're a um, resident, right, it will, um, that's what that is right there. Okay. So then now I'm going to go ahead and go to the next section, which is tax settings. Okay. Now, what is Steve Boswell to me? Well, Steve Boswell is a consultant, right? However, he is an independent contractor to us. So in this case, his um, tax ID number is going to be 
oh no, one, two, excuse me, one, two, dash, uh, one, two, three, four, okay? He has to use his social security number. Why? Because he's an independent 1099 worker. They are going to be filing taxes on their own. And you need to be able to use their social security number to be able to help them file the taxes for you, right? Every te every W-2 worker or every W-4 worker gets receives a W-2. Every 1099 worker receives a, 10, uh, a 1090, right? So with that being said, that's the same thing. We need to make sure that he is a legitimate 1099 worker. Now with this, again... This also, uh, by you putting this into QuickBooks, it also sends a message to the IRS to run this number to ensure that this guy really is an independent contractor. Because again, um, there's a lot of fraud going on in the world, so this is one of them, right? Running a social security number to ensure that this person is a legitimate independent contractor, right? Because some people, right? They'll take that. They'll say, I did a job for you. I'm a 1099 worker. So uh, run this report and then realize that they actually don't own their own company. So in this case, they'll get in trouble. So you want to make sure that this vendor is eligible to be a 1099 worker. Okay. And then we're going to go to account settings. Now, in this case, that means every time I use Stephen Boswell or Boswell Consulting, I'm going to link them to accounts or some expenses. So in this case, right, he's going to be considered a professional, um, professional fees. Okay, in this case, not that one, but professional fees. There you go. Okay. And that's it, right? So that means every time I use Stephen Boswell for his services, he's going to provide me professional consulting fees, right? And that means every time I receive a bill, it's going to automatically populate that he is there for professional expenses, okay? And you have up to three that um, a person can have, right? And then last but not least, we're going to go to additional information, which in this case, vendor type. Yes, you can have a vendor type. And in this case, he's a consultant. So again, you can, you can separate um, each vendor based on a type. So in this case, he is a consultant, right? You can have a supplier. You can have a tax agency, utilities, whatever, et cetera, et cetera. In this case, vendor types are not necessary unless you want further um, organization. And this one is just to organize your ideas a little more further, maybe run a report on how many expenses were, um, you know, supplier related or tax related. That's the only thing that this extra information does. So in this case, he is a consultant. Now, this is where we can fill in and have fun with our custom fields, right? Let's say, what if I want to know some, what if I learned um, something about uh, Mr. Boswell? Maybe I learned out when his a business was established. Okay. Maybe I found out he what his spouse's name was. Okay. So business establishment date, okay? And maybe he has a hobby, okay? Okay, and I click OK, and I click OK. So there you go. Now county, what county does he belong to? He belongs to Alameda, Alameda, I think that's how you spell it, Alameda. Um, let's see, um, spouse's name. Let's go ahead and use Linda, okay? His spouse's name is Linda, so Stephen and Linda Boswell, all right? Cool. Um, a business establishment date. Maybe he established his business as of May 25th, 2018, let's just say, okay? May 25th, 2018, so that means his company is about roughly three years old, 
All right, awesome. So when May rolls around, we can send him a nice little package saying, congratulations uh, on your fifth year, fourth year, whatever you want to do, okay? And let's say you found out that he likes to go fishing, okay? Maybe, hey, Stephen, I'm going to go on a camping trip. You want to go fishing with me? Awesome, right? Again, it's a relationship builder, okay? So now that you have that, right, then it is okay to now click okay, okay? Now, for any reason, you may need to make changes. Let's say maybe his terms have changed or his address has changed or, um, you know, anything. Maybe he, he is no longer married. Whatever the reasons that you need to change his profile, you can change it at any given time, right? You can simply right-click it or there's a little pencil icon right, right here. Or you know what you can do? The quickest and easiest way is double-click it. And you can go ahead and go right into the page and edit his information. Okay. You can even go as far as um, sticking um, any document. So if you have a business card, you can scan it and upload it. So then you have his business card at all times. So you can recognize his logo. Okay. So there's a lot of things you can do here. You can even upload documents such as um, contracts, right? What if you have, what if he made you sign a contract saying or or you made him sign a contract because he's a 1099 worker, right? Saying, if you're going to do services for me, this is the guidelines that you are going to be restricted to. This is what you're going to do. You're contracted, right? You can upload that document in here as well. All right. And there is a section for it. It's called the documents um, section. Um, it is part of your reading. Okay. Um, I won't get into it just as much details because, you know, it's... It's straightforward. Any reasons that you have a document that's related to either a vendor, customer, or employee, so especially employees, right? You have to collect their W-4 forms. Any kind of source of information that you don't want to hold on or have a physical copy for, scan it, copy it, upload it onto QuickBooks, and you have everything in the palm of your hands, okay? Or in this case, you have everything on the computer. All right, so that is how we create our vendor. Any questions here? No. Okay. All right. So there we have it. That's chap. That's that first section in chapter four. Let's see. We do have um, twenty minutes left in class, so let's go ahead and see. What is the next step here before uh, we go on and forth, okay? So now we're going to be looking at activating class tracking and job costing. Now, once again, this is where I was talking to you guys about earlier what a class is. Now, in this case, right, if you read this, it is when you want to um, further... Uh, separate or organize your income and expenses based on these five things, right? Based on location, based on department, based on line of business, based on um, any meaningful way that you want to separate your expenses and income for. So for this example, in this particular um, case study, we are using locations. There are two store locations. We had the Walnut Creek location and we have a San Jose location. Now, the great thing about running these um, uh, classes is that when I do my reports, my, in, my um, monthly, quarterly, whatever kind of report you want to do, you can compare how the profits are doing in the San Jose location versus the actual um Walnut Creek location, right? So that's the reason why you would use um, class tracking is so then you can further create more extensive reports on a particular idea or a particular question, right? So in this case, I can say, well, if I spend more money in the San Jose location because it's a bigger, popular, it's in an actual city that everyone knows, San Jose location, will my profits be higher? Okay, that could be a question you can ask. 
where if I go for Walnut Creek, which is it's a smaller um, city, which is in Santa Clara, right, which is like maybe 15 minutes away from San Jose on the freeway, Santa Clara is a small, small town. Walnut Creek is even a smaller city. So would I spend all my efforts investing a lot more money into my Walnut Creek location that doesn't do as much? Or let's say Walnut Creek has a lot more beautiful, more alert landscapes. Then yes, maybe those are the, that's the questions that you need to ask if you're going to be using class tracking. So for another example that's not in this case study would be Pepsi, right? Pepsi has, what, three lines of businesses, right? They have a soda beverage, they have a juice company, and they have a water company. Oh, and they're also part of Frito-Lay as well. So they have um, a potato chip company, right? That's four lines of businesses that they can compare saying, what sells more often, water or soda or chips? Do they work together, right? That's a great example that you could separate your income and expenses. How much more money are you spending for this part of the company, okay? And that's what class tracking does. Now, is it obligated? No, you don't need to use class tracking unless you have a means of using it. But in this case, this this um, case right here uses class tracking. And in order to activate that, if you want to use it, right, is that when you go into your edit, you're going to go to preferences. And this is a company preference, okay? You're going to go to accounting, company preferences, and down here will say, do you use class tracking? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Right here. Use class tracking, right? Right, to help you separate your income and your expenses. So it's already on because there's two store locations, right? But again, you do not have to have it on at all times. Now, where do you see these class trackings? Well, if I go to, for example, let's say I enter in a bill, okay? In the columns, right, you should have, see right here, you have customers, right? I'll talk about that in a second. Right here, you have class. So when you enter in an expense, you can separate it by saying, well, this one is going to be for the San Jose location or the Walnut Creek location. If it applies to both, let's say you're dealing with the bank, right? Obviously, the bank, you have one bank account for the company. It's going to be for both San Jose and Walnut Creek. Then you can create a, um, a, uh, another class for that represents both of them, which is um, overhead, right? So again, that's how you'd be able to find and uh, be able to define it. Now, how you define it is going to be based on what you find is going to give you the most meaningful information, okay? So that's class tracking, all right? Uh, what do you say no? Okay, and we'll talk about, we'll, we'll, do, uh, we'll do entering um, expenses on Monday, okay? So that's class tracking for you. Now, there's another small section here that asks for job costing. Now, what is job costing? Now, I've mentioned this before, right? It's another way of organizing your information based on income and expenses, but instead of designating a particular place, department, or um, line of business, this is tailoring it to a particular person, okay? And this particular person is most likely going to be a customer, right? Hence the word customer slash jobs or uh, colon jobs, okay? So that's what job costing does. So when you, uh, again, 
Um, job costing will be more relevant in chapter two as well as chapter nine. Chapter nine, we get to see the exact reasons why we use job costing is when we want to pass a bill along to another person because we, um, because we link this expense or that income to that particular customer, right? When you bill that customer, it's going to automatically pull that information up. Now, what you can use um, job costing is that if you're doing a particular job, let's say you're doing a photo shoot, right? You could say it's for this particular person, okay? Or you can link them to a vendor, right? You could say this job is associated with this person because they wanted that particular person to do the job, okay? So again, um, another one that you could use um, job costing for is if you are making um, tailored purchases or custom purchases for a per per particular customer, then you would tag that person in there because, um, again, um, that is how you link it. It's when you're using a person. So again, in this chapter, we don't see um, job costing as relevant or pre prevalent as um, you would normally use class settings, class um, tracking for. So again, if you want to add that in there, um, you do have to go to your, um, in chapter two, they show you how to do it, but I'll show it to you now. It's the same way, except when you go to um, your edit preferences, instead of going to accountant, you actually are gonna go to jobs and estimates. And, it, and here is where you're going to set up your um, job, your tracking the job, okay? All right. Um, and let's see. Last comment I'm going to say is how to um, actually uh, pay your vendors, okay? So there are a total of three ways that you can pay your vendors, right? Simple one is by writing a check, okay? Writing a check is the most easiest one and the most widely used one for expenses because one Writing a check allows you to have two things, right? It gives you a paper trail, right? It gives you a way to keep track of where that check went. Who did it go to? When did they check that they cashed it in? When did they actually acquire the expense, right? And then, of course, number two is to keep track of the expense itself, right? Where it also gives you proof that you paid for it, okay? So that's one way. You can also do credit cards, right? Of course, with the vast majority of the um, tech, tech, technology these days, right? Everybody uses a credit card. Who in the world carries a check nowadays? Not many people, okay? Um, I know for sure I don't carry cash either. I just carry my credit card, swipe, and I'm done, right? And that's what a lot of companies do too is that... Uh, Keeping track of a credit card is the easiest way because you can be accessed to your um, bank account at all times or even your credit card company. You can access it using your phone, right? Online application, online banking. You can look at how much you have at the in the palm of your hands anywhere you go. That's how easily accessible credit cards are, okay? Um, a third way is um, when you enter in a bill you need to pay off that bill, okay? Whether you use a check, visa, credit card, um, or you do an electronic funds transfer, so, or even using a debit card, okay? Those are all the options that you can do when you are paying a vendor, okay? And we're gonna dive all in that into all of that, how to enter it in, use a using the register, all on Monday, okay? Because it is now exactly 11.30, okay? So with that being said, now that we entered in our first vendor, we're gonna go ahead and um, take a look at what happens uh, when we enter in transactions on Monday. Any questions?